talk, and then as I thought, I'm going to go talk to a bunch of marine scientists, and they don't really want to hear about state-space models. So uh, I modified it a bit, quite, quite a lot actually, from focusing on state-space models to really um, more about interesting applications of state-space models in fishery science and management. Um, most, of, most of what I'll talk to you about is also mostly fishery science with a few, um, few lessons for fisheries management. So if we think about the, how current uh, fisheries management works, um, we try to take the, what's called the best available science um, in the form of data which comes in, in surveys of abundance and biomass, age composition, length, growth, movement, migration, whatever um, data we can have. And we feed that into various types of models and the models are meant to, to separate a lot of the, the noise in the observations to try to extract some information about stock size, productivity, and mortality, fishing mortality, natural mortality. Um, and then that, that science is used in um, mostly what are not, you know, a lot of people would like to think that they're science-based decisions in fisheries management, but they're really not. Um, most of them are science-informed. A science-based decision would be something where you could use uh, what we call optimal biological yield, or F M MSY in terms of yield, or FMSY, which is the fishing mortality. Um, these things are almost never implemented now in practice because uh, they're often seen as a bit too, uh, too optimistic and, and too aggressive. So what we do now is we, uh, but in order to deviate from that, you, you have to make some kind of trade-off. So um, science really informs trade-offs between conservation and yield. A lot of times we give up yield uh, for the benefit of some uh, assurance that stocks are not going to collapse and, and cause future problems. One of the stories I'll tell you later on is that despite um, you know, making pretty strong conservation yield trade-offs on the side of conservation, we still might have some really difficult choices to make. Um, and, and being precautionary, it, it, this is almost universal now, at least in uh, U.S., European, Canadian fisheries. Uh, that's where we, we can't uh, use uncertainty as an excuse for inaction. Um, optimal biological yield, as I mentioned, is seen more as a limit to exploitation now than a target. And the focus is more and more on building robust harvest strategies um, for long-term sustainability. And this is a, what you, you might have heard in fisheries called management strategy evaluation, which um, I've done a lot of work in, but um, I'm not going to talk about today. And then, of course, fishery science, I, just kind of in overview, I'm sure you all know these things, but in fishery science we try to understand interactions among physical and biological oceanographic regimes and how these affect fish productivity. So that's just a you know, big umbrella statement. Um, with, within these interactions, though, the abundance of the biological entities are rarely at equilibrium with these processes. So we're always trying to track, you know, uh, what the relationships are as they're moving through time. Uh, and we do that using observations that are quite often sparse. Um, you know, we don't get really highly detailed um, data collection on monthly, weekly, even annual sometimes time scales. Uh, in, in British Columbia, where I do a lot of groundfish work, uh, for some surveys we get observations every two years. And that, that data is often quite noisy especially in something uh, like the systems that I work in for the most part are multi-species type uh, fisheries where really you might, uh, a, a survey might go after 16 species and really only have precise estimates of two or three of them. And the rest, uh, the variances can be quite high in the observations. So, so there's a lot of noise in the observations that we're trying to filter out. And so this, this ends up being, uh, you know, we have a limited ability to learn about a lot of dynamics, you know, predator-prey dynamics, response to fisheries and so on, without some form of control experimentation and replication. The things that other sciences benefit from that we don't in fisheries. So a quick overview of the talk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a, one example. Um, I had a PhD student a few years back, uh, Mike Malik, who uh, did a lot of uh, Bayesian hierarchical modeling and state space modeling uh, of salmon productivity in the North Pacific. Uh, 
And so one, one example I'm going to show you is some of the location and scale dependence of salmon productivity on oceanographic processes. And the other one is about, is about marine mammals because this is something that uh, is a bit more exciting. Um, and will probably, the issues around marine mammals, at least um, in, in Canada uh, and in some places in the U.S., uh, will probably dwarf uh, small effects of oceanographic indices uh, influences on productivity. The specific I'll, example I'll give you is, is of gray seals um, possibly leading to extinction of an Atlantic cod. So Pacific salmon, uh, I'm sure you've probably had people come through here talking about Pacific salmon before. And th these are possibly the ideal marine, well, the, the ideal fish because they have uh, a well understood life history where they spend time in freshwater and then they spend time in the ocean. So uh, depending on which one you want to study, you can actually separate these two life phases pretty well. Um, the, whole, the holy grail of fisheries, of course, is stock and recruitment, trying to understand the relationship between parental stock and ultimate recruits. And in this case, we can separate them quite clearly. Uh, the stock and the recruits, the stock die after they spawn, so all that comes back are recruits, so that's pretty easy. Um, and they're also measurable. So um, the spawning stocks are often in, in rivers that are very accessible. Uh, so we can go out and actually uh, get pretty precise estimates of spawning stock, um, in, in some species at least. And then the recruits are quite easy to measure. They come in ocean fisheries, they come in recreational fisheries, however they come. We get pretty good estimates of catch, so we can, we can put all this together to look at stock and recruitment pretty well. And also they, they can be somewhat replicated, depending on how you, you, you can analyze these as replicated systems where this is an example that I'm going to show you later. These are uh, a bunch of sockeye salmon populations spread from the, uh, Washington up through British Columbia, uh, southeast Alaska, the Gulf of Alaska, and the Bering Sea. And this is, these are all sockeye salmon, so presumably they, show, they share something, some innate characteristics that we can treat as replicates, and then we can account for other uh, types of variation as well. So this, this particular um, example um, is, in a, is in a paper that Mike and I did for fisheries oceanography. Um, how does the North Pacific current influence salmon productivity in the Northeast Pacific? In, in, in fisheries oceanography with salmon, quite often we see correlations between um, oceanographic indices like sea surface temperature, salinity, uh, other things like that, and salmon productivity. And Quite often we, we think, well, the, the sea surface temperature effect, for instance, it doesn't affect physiology that much. It, it's not a big temperature effect, so it must be indexing something else. And so what, one of the things that Mike was interested in was whether um, how, the, how the North Pacific Current might actually provide an explanation for, for um, changes in productivity. So we looked at uh, two indices of the North Pacific Current. So this is, this is a cartoon of that current um, running from west to east across the North Pacific and it delivers water onto the continental shelf where it bifurcates down into the California Current and then up uh, to the Alaska Current that, that runs around the Gulf of Alaska. And so this, this current is going to affect temperature uh, depending on where this current, sometimes it, it, it comes across more northerly and so it'll bifurcate up here and other times it'll come out quite south and bifurcate down off Washington. And if you're just at a static point measuring the sea surface temperature, you're seeing those changes in temperature. Uh, but, what, but what else is happening, I'll show you in a minute, is when this current is north, it's delivering actually a cold water ecosystem down onto the continental shelf. Whereas if it's in the south, it's got a more of a warm water ecosystem that, that it's delivering. And so these these would result in, say, different types of zooplankton. You'd have the large-bodied, lipid-rich um, zooplankton from the north actually uh, being more available to fish, say, off British Columbia and southeast Alaska. So that was the thing we were really interested in studying. So, so Mike used um, a bunch of Oscar's uh, ocean current simulation uh, current patterns to, to simulate drifters, and he developed an index from that. The other, 
index is basically the volume, the, the amount of transport that this current is delivering from year to year. So this is basically what I just mentioned. So when the, when the bifurcation index, when it lands to the north, it delivers this cold, lipid-rich zooplankton community versus a warm, lipid-poor one. So this is, the, this is the only equation that I got to put in here. Uh, my original talk would have been full of them, but I thought that's a sure way to put people to sleep. So in, in this, this is basically the, the, ge the general model that we use to study the problem. And so we, we have a productivity index here. Now remember, we can measure directly the recruits and the spawners. So we know how many recruits came in for each spawner, and that's our productivity index. And so we have that for each stock and in each year. So we model that in, in these different components. So one is um, a stock-specific uh, Ricker model. If you're familiar with that, it's a basic population dynamics model. Uh, there's, a, there's a constant productivity, and then there's a density-dependent effect. This beta coefficient is normally negative, so that as the spawning stock gets larger, uh, the productivity goes down. So that would give you the density dependence in there. And then there's the bifurcation index and the North Pacific gyre oscillation index and then a noise term here that we did various things with this noise term. We looked at some autocorrelation in it and not and, and various types of models. But the idea here was to see how these coefficients on the bifurcation index and the NPGO varied uh, from zero uh, as well as over space. And so one of the things we, we, we did was uh, we grouped these stocks into different types of ecosystems depending on where they entered the ocean. So here the west coast is uh, mostly British Columbia, Washington, and then the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea. And we did this for three different species. For, for pink salmon, pink salmon, are, uh, they live for two years. So they have a very uh, discrete life cycle and mostly they're oceanic. So they're, they spend almost their entire uh, life in the ocean, so you'd expect to see a bit more sensitivity from them. Uh, chum salmon, which are also uh, more oceanic species, and then sockeye, which are uh, kind of half and half. They spend half their life in, the, in fresh water and half um, in salt water for the most part. So for here, here's the, the bifurcation index here is in black, the NPGO is in red, and then going across this axis is the stock number. So this is basically going from the southernmost one in Washington all the way up around the Gulf of Alaska, and then these would be Bering Sea. So you can see those groupings across the top there. So the idea is that we should see uh, a lot of similarity within the groups, and then maybe differences among the groups, and, and we do see that. Um, some of the big differences here are like, uh, <coughs> Yeah, for, so for sockeye here is, is the one that has what I think is the biggest effect of the bifurcation index, um, mostly different from zero. Um, the NPGO also for chum, which is one of the more oceanic species, uh, having a positive effect of the NPGO. So the, the interesting thing here is that the west coast tends to actually show a lot of these effects, whereas the stocks up in the Bering Sea, which you would expect being well out of the, the reach of the North Pacific current, don't really show much. There's a lot of variation there and pretty much not different from zero in most of those cases. So on, on the West Coast, for instance, there's about an average, these uh, gray bars here, uh, the bifurcation index effects on productivity percentage-wise, and so they're close to uh, 10 or 11 percent um, when you have a higher bifurcation index, you get about 11% boost in productivity. Um, and as I was saying, the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea have um, pretty much no effect of those, those things. And then for the different species, pink, pink salmon, which are the most oceanic and most subject to, to these oceanic uh, effects, have the biggest effect, almost a 27 or so percent increase in productivity and the least effect on sockeye, which spend the least amount of their life cycle in the ocean. So basically from this, we, we, for fisheries management, um, when, we think, when we try to 
say, forecast fisheries productivity, sometimes we do that using ocean conditions. But what this is showing is that the influences of, of the oceanographic effects are really location, scale, um, and time dependent. The time one here I, I'm not showing, but it's in another paper that we did showing that uh, phytoplankton phenology or the timing of the seasonal blooms in, in phytoplankton actually affect productivity in the Bering Sea and Gulf very differently from the West Coast as well. They're almost opposite in their effects. So these, this really isn't, doesn't bode well for forecasting when, when you have all these, these detailed things that you need to know about a location. You really can't generalize very well about oceanographic uh, effects. Okay, um, now to the, to the fun stuff with marine mammals. Uh, as you probably are aware, a lot of marine mammals uh, are growing worldwide. They're huge consumers of uh, fish production in most cases, the big ones. And basically the hypothesis that we're putting together now is that in Canada at least, the impacts on productivity are going to uh, be much bigger than they are for oceanographic. Uh, effects. So this is an example of uh, four different marine mammal populations in, in British Columbia. Uh, there, are, there are killer whales, which those are the orcas. Um, there's a northern resident population. These, these eat fish, so mostly Chinook, some chum salmon. There's about 247 uh, northern resident killer whales right now. Uh, that's about a doubling of the population since the 1970s. There's a southern resident killer whale population. There's only about, uh, actually less than that now, but now there's about 78. At this data set here was about 81. Um, this population here is one that I'm going to mention in a minute. It's, uh, it's an endangered species in the U.S. and a species at risk in Canada. Um, I'll, I'll, let me get to that in a minute. Harbor seals over here, you can see, were just a couple of thousand in the 1970s. Now there's almost 40,000 of them. And stellar sea lions uh, that eat everything from herring, salmon, uh, and other things, uh, almost tripling over time. So if you add up the amount of consumption that these marine mammals, mu they must be eating a lot. And so uh, just quickly an aside on these southern resident killer whales, um, I was on a panel years back looking at, down here, the effects of salmon fisheries on southern resident killer whales. So the, the issue here is that um, because this is an endangered species, it needs to be assessed every so many years to see if it should be delisted. And the question was whether this population is actually uh, stable or declining uh, or increasing. And it certainly isn't increasing very much. And so the question was, uh, well, we have all these Chinook salmon fisheries, and these southern resident killer whales in particular are, are almost obligate Chinook salmon predators. They're supposed to be intelligent, but when there's no Chinook salmon around, they apparently can't find anything else to eat. Even when 10 million sockeye salmon go swimming by, they don't eat them. <laughs> we didn't spend much time on that, that issue, but <laughs> anyway, it seemed odd. But anyway, as, as, part of this, uh, as part of this review, we, we, we it went over two years and several workshops with all kinds of scientists from the marine mammal side and the salmon side and fisheries and various things. One of the things that came out of this, um, this population here, the 81 southern residents need 200,000 Chinook salmon per year um, to, to meet their, their demands. Um, the population of, of Chinook in in this particular area uh, is only about 400,000 a year. Uh, sometimes it's less than 200,000 a year. So one of the things we thought about as a, as a panel was, well, maybe, maybe fisheries aren't the problem. Maybe southern residents are the problem. You know, maybe they're kind of eating themselves out of house and home. And so if you start to account for, well, then how many did this, does this 247 also eat? Um, and then Harbor seals uh, feed on juvenile salmon as they're going out, uh, out of the rivers. Uh, stellar sea lions feed on them while they're on their feeding grounds. So 
it wasn't an unreasonable hypothesis to say maybe fisheries aren't the issue, maybe they're, they're actually um, you know, running into a bottleneck themselves. So that actually uh, stimulated a, a, a group out of Washington uh, to do a paper on this, and it just came out last fall. I think it actually uh, came out in December. But. And so they wanted to look at really how do you apportion Chinook salmon consumption among all the marine mammal predators uh, across the entire range of Chinook salmon. So this, this uh, integrates from Oregon, maybe Oregon, California, all the way up uh, into the Bering Sea. And so th this is how it breaks out. So since the 1970s, killer whales, they, they used to be responsible for about 4,500 or so tons. Uh, these are metric tons of Chinook salmon, now it's almost 10,000 tons. Uh, harbor seals here, which as I mentioned, eat mostly juveniles. Um, the, the, uh, the numbers are large, the biomass is small of course because they're eating small juveniles, but the numbers of Chinook salmon are quite large. Uh, California sea lions, again almost uh, quadrupling there, and stellar sea lions. So across the board here, there's a huge amount of extra consumption here that wasn't around in the 1970s. And this is over the same time where fisheries uh, right now, uh, fisheries exploitation rates are about half of what they were in the 1970s. So this, this increase in marine mammal predation has more than compensated for reductions in, that um, fisheries have made in Chinook salmon catch. Um, we pointed out a couple of other things. Another one was, so we, we, uh, we looked at some population dynamics models and said, okay, well, if you, if you stop fishing under some scenarios, um, you would actually reduce the amount of recruitment of Chinook salmon because, because they show a dome-shaped production function. If you, if you reduce the fishing mortality rate, you're actually going to increase the spawning stock a little bit and reduce the recruitment a little bit. Um, that's pretty much been ignored, um, and this has been ignored, and they apparently just allocated $12 million to further research on southern resident killer whales, um, and they still want to close the fishery. So. Um, here, here's another one, um, humpback whales, which um, we're just starting to look at humpback whale uh, possible impacts on herring, which are a forage fish off British Columbia. So this is, a, this is a paper showing all the different growth rates of humpback whale populations around the world. Uh, and you can see that the annual growth rates here from 3% to greater than 12% based on the size of these triangles. So for the most part, humpback whales are doing really well. Um, off British Columbia, they're growing at about 4 to 6% per year. And you can see that uh, this whole coast here is one of the main feeding grounds of humpback whales, and one of the things the, they eat are herring. Um, and this is just some detail from sightings data, uh, some of the marine mammal surveys off the coast of British Columbia, and showing where they're mostly found. So they're mostly found um, in waters, this is called Haida Gwaii, this island here. This is a really productive area um, for all kinds of fish species, and especially herring, um, as well as down here. Uh, they're not really seen very much. These are called the inside waters here. This is inside Georgia Strait. Vancouver is just right around there. Uh, but humpback whales are moving back into this uh, Georgia Strait area more recently. So from our, from our fisheries models, we, we can estimate the natural mortality rates over time of Pacific herring in different stocks. And so there's, there's two inside stocks. This is uh, Strait of Georgia and Prince Rupert. And these two mainly have been, I mean, some of this is noise that it's picking up, but for the most part, the trends are, are fairly steady over time. There hasn't been a huge change in, in mortality rates. The, the outside stocks, particularly the ones that are uh, around the feeding areas of humpback whales, have shown over, this is about a two decade uh, period, have increased quite a bit. In fact, the, the fisheries in these three areas have been closed for about 15 years and the stock hasn't, hasn't come back and hasn't even grown and it's declined further in most of these cases. So this is a, a situation where uh, we have 
a humpback whale population that's going to continue to grow. And then uh, fisheries, we have commercial aboriginal fisheries that depend on herring uh, that may just have to sit and wait, um, hopefully for these stocks to come back. Um, so that, that's kind of, at, at this stage, we're, you know, we're just starting to look at some hypotheses and start to do some modeling on these. Um, this is the one that we've done the most work on so far. Um, this is a situation in uh, the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence. So this is, uh, it was, so here's Massachusetts here. There's Boston, that's Maine, Nova Scotia, uh, Newfoundland, and Labrador. And this is the St. Lawrence River coming out of Montreal, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So there's a, there historically has been a huge uh, cod stock, a uh, couple of hundred thousand ton cod stock in this, uh, in this gulf that supported a fishery. Um, as I'll show you in a minute, these guys, which are called gray seals, have been uh, growing faster than any of the ones I've shown you so far <laughs> and possibly wreaking havoc on this particular population. So the point here is that this, this cod stock it, uh, was collapsing as a result of fishing possibly. Uh, the fishery was closed and the stock continued to collapse and now it looks like it's uh, an accelerating collapse. And so we, we were building models to see if uh, we could link this, if this was linked to gray seal predation. Uh, not a good fish to study if you're just getting started in fisheries. Uh, you can't really separate stock and recruitment and neither is directly measurable. Uh, you need fairly complicated state space models. There we go, state space models. That's, I think I put it in there. Uh, to, to estimate parameters, so the, the models that I'm, I'll be showing you, there are probably 30 to 40 parameters in these models that have to be estimated from uh, abundance composition, pregnancy rates, predation rates, and so on, that kind of data. And unlike salmon, gray seal, stod, uh, sorry, gray seal cod uh, interactions are not replicated. Uh, we basically have two cod stocks that we could look at here. One is the one I'm showing you. Another one is uh, on eastern Georgia's bank, which is off the coast of Massachusetts. So here's the, the, situ the, the fishery situation. The, the cod spawning biomass uh, had this nice big boost of production in the 1980s and then started to collapse and at this time in the 90s when there was a large-scale moratorium on fishing in, in eastern Canada, uh, the fishery was basically closed. Um, and there's, there's really no fishing going on. So most of what we're, I'm going to show you in a minute as far as mortality rates, it's not due to fishing. You, you just couldn't catch that many fish and have it not be, be measured. Um, at the same time, the gray seal population, this is the, this is the range here, this dark thing of gray seals. Um, and this star covers what's called Sable Island. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Sable Island, but it's basically a pile of sand out in the middle of nowhere that is covered in gray seals. Uh, the, the population of gray seals on this island is now close to 500,000 animals. Um, one of the questions is, well, why, where were they? Like, where do these things come from? Um, there, you know, in, in Canada, there's been historically been lots of seal hunting. Um, could be that fishermen used to shoot marine mammals and things like that. But to explain this kind of growth is a bit, uh, there's not much to explain it, except perhaps that there was once a walrus population on Sable Island. And hunting out the walrus actually opened up some prime breeding habitat for gray seals. Um, and it's just a, it just happens to be a good spot. So it could be something where uh, a small uh, mortality or extirpation of, of the walrus has led to that. This lower graph here just um, shows seal years spent in the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence. So we were, we used this to derive an index of uh, predation uh, exposure for cod in the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence because the gray seals, they don't spend their entire uh, year in the southern Gulf. They spend some down here at George's Bank um, and different places. So um, we've got some tagged animals that have given this distribution type information. Uh, 
So when you plug all this into a model and you, you put a functional response in there for uh, predation, um, we, grace, the thing about gray seals is they don't, um, they don't prey on young cod, they target uh, mature spawning cod. So we have a couple of models here. One, one of these circles uh, is a model that has no seals in it and the dark line and the gray uncertainty range here is a model with seals in it. And so the mortality rates here for, for juvenile, basically ages one to four, have been pretty stable over time, just kind of fluctuating. Um, whereas the mature stock, the total mortality, natural mortality rate here has been increasing quite a bit over time, um, whether we put the seals in or not. And then this is the component, if we, um, if we separate out the components into predation and non-predation, you can see that this basically follows quite a bit the, uh, the gray seal trend. And um, the other mortality here, it's, I mean, this could just be what models do. When you, when you apply a lot of predation mortality, it, it has to take it from somewhere, so it removes it from other M here. But the point here is that for a cod stock that would normally have a natural mortality rate, you know, in an unexploited state, a pristine state down around 0.2 here, or even lower, um, a mortality rate of something around 0.8 is definitely not sustainable. And so what, what we, if you look at the relationship between the productivity of the stock and its biomass, normally what you would expect in a, in a compensatory type of situation would be when the stock is really large, the growth rate should be somewhere near zero because it's at, at its limit and the growth rate should increase as the stock gets smaller, right? That's it's compensating and it's, uh, I mean, that's why they're still, uh, these stocks would still exist. But what happens here is that, in, and part of this is confounded with time because of this, presumably the seal trend, um, at low population size, these stocks are now growing negatively. So there's only one way for this to go uh, unless somehow uh, productivity boosts higher. So this, this eventually would signal at least uh, some sort of quasi-extinction for, for this particular stock. Now, I don't know, have you guys ever had Carl Walters here to talk? Or, no? Anybody ever heard of Carl? Oh. Okay. So, I, so at this point, he, he would say, now what are we going to do with these fish-eating bastards? So it, it's, <laughs> This is where you know the, the, the polite ecology talk goes out the window. And uh, anyway, um, so we, we couldn't help but uh, run some projections to say, well, you know, we just did a whole paper on uh, linking seals to cod predation. Well, what happens if we controlled seals? Because in Canada, we actually do hunt seals still. Uh, you can buy really nice gray seal mittens and hats and whatever else. Um, uh, some people are looking at developing markets for gray seal meat. Um, one of the problems with that is it's fairly polluted. As they, they accumulate a lot of uh, pollutants. Um, so harvesting younger seals would actually be better. <laughs> I won't go too far into that. In any case, this is just a, a general, that's one of my, one of my PhD students is stuck with this analysis right now. And uh, every time he gives a talk on it, he has to kind of bring a bodyguard with him. <laughs> but somebody has to do it because there's this actually is a, a policy recommendation to assess whether and to what degree uh, this might actually work. So in this case, if, uh, if there was no reduction in the seal population. This is green is the historical trend just over the last uh, decade. Uh, the population is declining at this rate. It would continue. And there's a, couple of, there's a couple of year classes in there right now that would cause a little bit of a bump, but for the most part, over the long term, it's projected to decline uh, to zero. Um, if there was a 25% reduction in seals, it would still decline to zero. If there was a 50% reduction, it would still decline only for a 65% reduction in seals would this population actually maintain itself. And over the next, um, whatever, many decades, it's, it's probably not going to change much either. In fact, it's going to go even lower than it is right now. Um, 
so this, this assumes that, of course, we got this right, that it actually is seals. We actually don't know that. It's, it's a hypothesis. It's kind of consistent with some of the data, but we don't really know that. So that's one of my PhD students now is working on uh, simulating different types of experiments to see what kind of experiment you would have to do and for how long to actually figure out if, if this is correct. Um, because it might be something else. Uh, nobody really knows. By the way, there, there are some ways of doing this without killing anything. Anybody have any ideas on that? Limit access Sterilize. to the island? Sterilization is... is uh, could you limit access to the island? You could limit access to the island. That's another. Get the walruses back. Like this probably, there's possibly some other alternatives, but... What was that? Was it another idea besides? <laughs> yeah, sterilization is probably uh, one of the more feasible ones. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, well, when, the, when they're, when they're in, uh, in, in breeding, they're actually all in the same place, at least, and you could possibly do something. Anyway, it gets weird, right? It, this is the <laughs> it gets weird really fast to think about this kind of mass, you know, population reduction. Anyway, um, so to summarize here, um, basically oceanographic forecast at large scales, uh, you know, we, we have climate models that can forecast changes in oceanographic um, processes into the future, but linking those to fish productivity are going to be difficult because of the location, scale, and time dependence. Um, talking to Cam this morning, I'm, I'm a bit more encouraged, actually, because of some of the things that they're able to do with spatial models now, and uh, maybe these things are, can be done in the future. Um, despite being precautionary, this is the kind of thing where fisheries managers, they're just seem to always, any fisheries managers here? No. <laughs> okay, we won't bash on fisheries managers, but even when they try to do the right thing, uh, they're, they're getting you know, subject to these things like marine mammals coming back and overcompensating for reductions in, in fishery catch. So this basically implies that their job is going to get harder. Uh, they're gonna have to start making uh, choices to prioritize fisheries, marine mammals, and in, in a few cases, uh, species at risk. We, we're running into more and more of these situations where uh, something that's protected is causing a problem for another. We have this for sea otters as well. Uh, we have sea otter abalone ecosystems in British Columbia where it's, it's the same situation. Um, so these, these uh, are going to become some pretty significant challenges for fisheries management in the future. So that's it. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>